Hi, and welcome to Scope. Alexandra is out on an interview, but will be joining us shortly. Today, we've selected some special topics for your viewing enjoyment. My personal favorite is about wolves. I've always been fascinated by them. But did you know that they were in danger of extinction in the U.S.? Oh, hey. Hey. How are you? Hi, Joe. How are you? Good. I just came back from interviewing one of the most unusual Nobel laureates. You know Carrie Mullis, the mm -hmm. one who specializes in molecular biology? His opinions on just about anything you can think of are most controversial and really quite colorful. Oh, right. Uh, today we'll also cover the saga of Mikey, a seven-year-old boy who received a spacesuit from NASA to cope with his strange genetic disease. So onwards with another extraordinary show. In the U.S., an animal species once threatened by extinction has made a remarkable comeback. We're referring to the wolf. Today, they're roaming freely and expanding their territory, which also means occasionally scavenging in the countryside. Thanks to the efforts of the U.S. Wildlife Department, wolves are alive and well in this country. In 1967, they were on the endangered species list. They were disappearing due to legal and illegal hunts and loss of habitat. Ed Bangs is the leader of their restoration drive. Wolves disappeared from the northern Rocky Mountains about 1930, and they've been gone for the past 60 years. Their return will have a profound impact on the relationships between big game animals and their environment, and possibly the relationships between smaller predators, such as coyotes, lynx, uh, wolverine, and possibly bobcats. The wolves were reintroduced from Canada into Wisconsin, Montana, Michigan, and Minnesota. And it was in Minnesota that Scope learned the latest result of this dramatic turnaround. We spoke with Sam Merrill, research biologist for the Department of Natural Resources of the state. Sam is working with a pack of wolves that live in a peculiar refuge, Camp Ripley, a U.S. Army training center. This is a, a public land body, and, and wolves are a federally protected species. So there's a requirement to monitor the population's health and trajectory, and to make sure that nothing adverse happens to the population. In the summer, 40,000 troops trained here. Sam's research team was afraid that the military activities would disturb the wolves, but surprisingly, they were oblivious to it. They've had um, lots of troops and vehicles running and explosions going off not particularly far away from them. So the real message has been that wolves can reproduce and do pretty much everything they do just fine as long as the activity that surrounds them is not focused on their extermination. Another phase of the study is to trace the wolf's movements with the help of collars that emit radio signals via satellite. Sam can monitor their wanderings. This is one of the first opportunities we had to look at an animal that had a radio collar on and watch as the animal moved through the landscape, dispersed out of its home range. The red lines indicate the wolf's trajectory. Sam explains that the animals initially attempt little trips around the camp before venturing into longer forays. And then when the animal finally left, it went over here and came all the way down and then came back and went through, these green areas are, are cities, they're metropolitan centers. This was a city of 70,000 or so. It's amazing how bold the wolf becomes after surmounting its initial fears. And it went 140 miles and then turned around and came back a month later. Well, we had seen a lot of short trips where an animal comes back to its home range, but never a really long trip. And another thing is on its way back, the whole second month, it followed almost exactly the same route. 
and we don't know how it knew exactly where to go. It had some kind of complex memory of visual cues, perhaps olfactory cues. The reintroduction of the wolves has been so successful that the animals have been taken off the endangered species roster. But in some states, problems still persist. In Arizona, for example, nine of 11 new wolves were killed, either by gunshot or by poison. That's telephone. Peggy Callahan is the executive director of the Wildlife Science Center in Forest Lake, Minnesota. She advocates that there are a lot of myths concerning wolves. Number one, that wolves are going to decimate their prey populations, that if a, a wolf will eventually eat all the deer and, and that will be it, and then they'll start turning to everything else. And there have been now 45, 50 years of exhaustive studies looking at how wolves impact deer. Here in Minnesota, perfect living experiment we have had a steady, gradual increase in the wolf population. We have also had a simultaneous, steady increase in deer population in the same areas where the wolves are. Another myth that plagues the wolf is that they are simply going to turn to humans as a source of food. We have not seen this historically. In North America, for example, we really don't see wolves turning to human beings for prey at all. Even dispelling the notion that humans are the wolf's favorite prey the same can't be said of livestock. We know wolves kill livestock, and that's a reality that's hard for all of us to face. But what we also know is that we have about 7,200 farms annually, uh, between 80 and 90 farms have problems. So it's one to two percent of the population of, of farms lose livestock. That's staggeringly low. The question to me is not why do wolves kill livestock, it's why don't they? We asked Peggy how the resurgence of wolves affected the balance of nature, the ecosystem. An example would be in Yellowstone National Park. The wolves are controlling the coyote numbers. Coyotes were the top dog. Now wolves are, and wolves actually will kill some coyotes. Coyotes impact small mammals, like rabbits and mice, etc. With coyote numbers reduced, small mammal numbers are increased because wolves don't spend the time to hunt little things. And lo and behold, the birds of prey are increasing. For Sam Merrill, study programs are vital in demystifying and regulating the presence of wolves on developed land. This information about adapting to human activities is important for us as managers of a species because we need to know how the species responds to human activities around it in order to be able to construct guidelines for, when, for example, when it's appropriate to um, kill a wolf if it's taken cows. Carrie Mullis is renowned in the scientific community as the strangest person to have received the Nobel Prize. It was awarded to him in 1993 for chemistry. It was therefore both a challenge and a treat to interview him. I mean, I really don't care what people think about me that much, you know, because I know for certain that I did something once in my life, and everybody knows that I did it, and it changed a big part of the world, okay? It really made a difference. There's not a single, you know, right within about two miles of us right now, there's probably 5,000 machines, all of them doing PCR. I did invent that, nobody doubts that. The procedure that he's famous for, which he coined with the initials PCR, revolutionized molecular biology. Prior to his new technique, genetic material available for experiments was scarce. In the 70s, the only way to duplicate a DNA sequence was to clone it. This meant capturing small DNA sequences and placing them in bacteria. This process was laborious and time-consuming, because after the cloning, you had to identify the specific DNA sequence, which wasn't easy. This whole procedure could take as long as a year. You're looking for a needle in a haystack, and what, and either, instead of finding a very sensitive method for finding the needle, what I found was a way to turn the whole haystack into needles because the copies of DNA are exactly the same <laughs> as the original. You, you make copies of it and then you can use them to, 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 to do the determination, like you want to figure out what particular sequence that you've looked at. So I guess that's what I got the Nobel Prize for. I mean, it really turned a lot of molecular biology completely 
upside down, all, all kinds of techniques that people had spent years learning how to do. Suddenly those things weren't important anymore. And it's a, now you have to learn this new thing, which is awfully simple, and any idiot can do it. Zenith Corporation, which housed the lab in Berkeley, California, where Carey worked, wound up with a patent of the new invention. They later sold it to an outside firm. Carey felt betrayed, resigned, and moved to La Jolla in Southern California, where he now lives with his wife, model Nancy Cosgrove. Continuing our report on Kerry Mullis, we now find him at 55, more relaxed, but an avowed cynic and skeptic. He loves to espouse his controversial thoughts among his peers. Yeah, I'm an older guy now, and so I don't work at the, in the lab anymore myself with my own hands. I sit in rooms like conference rooms and talk to scientists who themselves direct people that work in labs. He just recently published a book, Dancing Naked in the Minefield, full of his radical ideas. Among them, he denies that there's a hole in the ozone layer. I can't find any evidence that there is any such thing as global warming. In fact, it's kind of warm today, but it's not real warm. And I don't understand why human beings would think that they have anything to do with the weather. You know, given the fact that we've had numerous ice ages in the last 500,000 years, we all of us have sort of gone a little manic, I think, on this notion that we're destroying our planet. Right now, the Russians aren't destroying anymore. It's us, you know. It's us, all of us collectively doing it. it. It fits into some little place in our heart that needs to feel guilty about ourselves. Kerry is diametrically opposed to the views of Mario Molina, who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1995. In 1974, this Mexican chemist determined that chloride-fluoride carbons, more commonly known as Freon, destroys the ozone layer and exposes mankind to ultraviolet rays and the danger of skin cancer. What we are claiming, of course, is that this industrial activity, the production and the release of these industrial compounds, has uh, a global impact, that it really affects the functioning of the planet. Carrie thinks this is all poppycock. I talked to the guy who got the Nobel Prize, Mario Molina. I said, how, how can this possibly be? And I went through, I said, you know, I read your textbook on upper atmospheric physics. I can't find anything in there that would convince me that a little chlorine atom, that some chlorine atoms up there, which is what he's claiming, would change anything. And, and I explained to him why. And it's a complicated argument, but I mean, he couldn't answer it. So I said, well, why then? Are you sponsoring, basically, this thing is going to cost us probably, I don't know how many trillions of dollars it's going to cost to replace all the Freon in the world, because every air conditioner, every refrigerator. Kerry maintains that many scientists are conspiring with the U.S. government in these schemes just to make money, and is convinced that AIDS is not caused by HIV. And right now, you can make money by prophesying a plague, for instance, like HIV, AIDS thing, that, that whole totally ridiculous kind of scam. Any kind of immune problems these days in the world are considered to be AIDS without even testing for HIV. And then they treat for HIV. It's insane. It's not insane if you're sitting on the collecting end of the several billion dollars a year that's being made by the pharmaceutical industry treating this disease. Somebody's making money off of those things, and it's not necessarily, there's no free information. You know, when you see a scientist on television, he's got a reason for being there, usually, besides helping the world. His paranoia has caused his expulsion from many conferences, where other scientists believe he's a crackpot. It's a crazy idea that human beings, you know, the idea that we can change this place, that we're a large element on this planet, if you look at the Earth from space, you don't see humans very much. And there's the ants outweigh us. The ants outweigh us. Most people would, would think, well, they outnumber us. But no, they outweigh us by a rather large factor. And we don't know what they're doing down in their little holes at night. Crackpot or not, he's a Nobel laureate for his brilliant biological work. It was indeed a pleasure to converse with such a vivid, off-the-wall character. Well, I'd say, I'm different from just about anybody else you've ever met, whether the Nobel Prize or not.
small step for NASA and a giant step for mankind. But no one's going to confuse seven-year-old Mikey Walker with a mini-astronaut because he has no intentions of traveling to the moon. Why? Because he knows exactly what he wants to be when he grows up. I'm a wrestler. An arm wrestler. Why? A wrestler. A wrestler. This energetic youngster has courage to spare, but his demeanor is masked by the spacesuit. Mikey was born with a rare genetic disease called congenital erythropoietic porphyria. Mikey's body couldn't metabolize a chemical substance called porphyrin. The tragic result is that excessive quantities of porphyrin are deposited on the skin and break open when in contact with ultraviolet rays, causing inflammations, boils, blisters, abdominal pains, and other adverse effects. This only means that Mikey must avoid the sun and any other source of light that emits these rays. When I was a little kid, yeah. when I was a baby, I did, I had all these. Yeah. Yeah. And all of these. In the first six years of his life, Mikey could only play outside the house at night. But his life changed drastically. NASA donated a somewhat modified spacesuit originally designed for astronauts. It protects Mikey from ultraviolet rays. Angela Walker is Mikey's mother. Before Mikey got the suit, we would get up and get ready for school in the mornings. Um, he didn't ride a school bus because they couldn't protect him from the sun. So we would take him and put a sheet or a blanket over top of him to get him from the house to the van. It was pretty much he had to be carried in and carried out. And it, as he got bigger, that got a little rough. He's a hefty little child. <laughs> is there a cure for this disease? There is no cure. He will always be allergic to the sun, or allergic to the UV rays, I should say. Besides NASA, there's another remarkable person who helped Mikey's family regain their freedom, Sarah Ann Moody. Sarah founded and is the president of HED, an organization dedicated to donate refrigeration systems and protective garb to children with rare diseases. It was Sarah who initially contacted NASA to develop a cooling system for her nephew, who was born without sweat glands. This led indirectly to Mikey's problem, the need for a suit to shield him from sunlight. If they can put a man on the moon, they can do something to help him. That's what first went through my mind. The prototype of the first suit was tested by two English children suffering from an unusual skin allergy. Good Morning America was doing a show where they were checking up on the children in England who received the first suits. So I got on the telephone and I called Sarah and I was like, Mikey is excited. He saw this suit on TV. He wants one. One phone call. One phone call completely changed that child's life. And Sarah was like, you know, I was going to call you. She said, well, we're working with NASA. We're coming up with a prototype. And we want Mikey to be the one to tell us how it works. Shouldn't you have another suit in case this one gets too soiled or torn? Right. We're working on, you know, getting the money. We want to get Mikey another one. We're washing this suit daily. Yes, we want to get a gray one. <laughs> Robert Norwood is the director of the NASA Commercial Technology Program. We asked him why NASA would be involved in a problem as mundane as this. Part of our mission is to help the quality of life of, of citizens. Uh, and however we can do that, um, it's part of our job to do so. And this happened to be one that was fairly easy to do. Uh, because of the expertise of, of NASA in developing spacesuits and protective gear for astronauts. In spacesuits, the things that you want to do is obviously provide a human environment for inside the spacesuit. But you want the material to be very light and very tough uh, because space is a very hazardous environment and there's a lot of radiation and, and things like that. Having knowledge about that design, we can apply it to sort of everyday sort of uh, applications like uh, these uh, suits to protect uh, the children. Mikey's suit was lighter and more practical than the ones used by the astronauts. The total cost of the suit is only $2,000. All in all, our hats are off to NASA for their charitable deed. It's not only freed the child, but you freed the family. There's a certain amount of guilt that lives with the parents about what they can do and what they can't do. They have two or three normal healthy children. They've got one that can't do the things. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna stay at home. The whole family means no picnics, means no theme parks. 
It means they don't get to do things as family except things they do within the house. Angela relates that Mikey's ordeal has taken a toll on his brother Andy, who is two years older. It was hard on him at first, but he's grown up with Mikey. So he pretty much got used to it. Now since he's gotten the suit, they're all, it's like all of them got their life back. Helping Mikey to get into the suit is a gratifying activity for the whole family. When my mother asked me to help him, I, um, he, he gets the gloves on and he tells me to do the rest. That's the only thing he does. Mikey is now learning to dress himself and the time it takes him to put on all the pieces is decreasing every day. Um, 10 minutes, um, five minutes. Just, if you have a child, just hang in there. It, it doesn't really get easier. You just really learn to live with it and adapt your life around them. It's not their fault. You have, just have to live with it. Thank you. Wow, what a display of courage. Not only from Mikey, but from his whole family. Yeah, unbelievable. And I can't get my mind off of Carrie Mullis. What an eccentric personality. I had such a good time interviewing him. And how about the, uh, the wolves with human tendencies? I thought that was good. Yeah, yeah, like human wolves in sheep's clothing, huh? I'm in a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> Turning to our next show, we'll amaze you again with astonishing stories taken out of tomorrow's headlines and some not so well publicized but just as stunning. So we bid you goodbye for now.